Hey guys, this is Melissa with Love Covered Life, and today I want to talk to you about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It seems to me that the church has become very disconnected in some aspects, and I don't want to lump everybody together, but um, certain branches of the church and the religious system of Christianity as a whole has gotten really off track with what the message of the gospel is actually supposed to be about. And so I want to start a series where I go through this topic. And please know before I start that there is a lot to this subject and I will not be able to cover it all in one video. I am going to be starting in the beginning of Matthew with this video and talking about what Jesus called the gospel of the kingdom. We'll get to the subject of Jesus' death on the cross later on in this series. We have to build a foundation to work up to that first. We need to begin with the teachings of Jesus first and how that leads up to his death on the cross. And that's just gonna take multiple videos. There's no way I can do it all in one. There is no question that if you read through the gospels, Matthew through John, Jesus' message was about what he calls the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus' message is about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. So the very first thing we need to do is understand what is this gospel of the kingdom that was the center of Jesus' entire message. There's a whole lot of talk in the church about the gospel. And there's a whole lot of talk in the church about heaven in the kingdom of heaven. The very first thing that we need to do anytime that we are studying the Bible, this it's imperative that we do this, is that we need to understand as best as we can the cultural context in which the particular book of the Bible that we are studying was written. So who was Jesus speaking to when he talked about the gospel of the kingdom? Um, what was the religious history and context of that time and how would they have understood his message. He wasn't speaking to 21st century Americans. He was speaking to first century Jews. Jesus was speaking to first century Jews particularly who were looking for their Messiah. So the ancient Hebrew belief in the Messiah evolved over time and was based off of Old Testament prophecies, primarily in the books of Isaiah and Jeremiah. The prophecies were understood to be of a future ideal king. The Messiah was to bring about an era of universal peace in which every person on earth would come to know God through the influence of Israel. Israel was to be the light to the world that would bring all the nations into a knowledge of God. And if you read through the Old Testament prophets, you see this over and over. The most obvious references to the Messiah are in Isaiah and Jeremiah, but all through the prophets, you see an ongoing theme that all people, all nations of the earth will eventually come and worship. The entire message of the Old Testament prophets is one of universal reconciliation. And I actually have a video, an hour long video on this point and a great portion of that video is taken up with Old Testament prophecies that are prophesying the eventual redemption and reconciliation of all people back to God. And this is where the belief in the Messiah came from and the belief that there would be what was called a messianic age in which peace and utopia would exist on the earth. After Israel was conquered by Rome, the belief in a personal Messiah began to emerge. This was partially because the Jews were so desperate for their freedom and partially because um, Greco-Roman thought began to infiltrate and mix in with Jewish beliefs. Um, and because of this, there, there we see so many different versions of what the, uh, the Messiah would be emerging during this time that it's impossible to trace all of them back to their origins. There is some evidence that as early as the first century BC, the Jews had adopted the Platonic belief in the pre-existence of souls. And because of this, um, a view of the Messiah began to emerge as somebody who um, existed eternally. He was referenced as the son of man who sat at the right hand of the father and would come at the end of the age to judge the evil and the good. We do see Jesus address this particular version of the Messiah where he uses some of his parables to turn 
this idea on its head. A prime example of this would be the parable of the sheep and goats, where Jesus tells the religious leaders that the Son of Man will welcome into his kingdom at the end of the age those who have shown love to the least of these. Um, because in that time, the common understanding was that the powerful and the wealthy were blessed by God, and that's why they had material wealth and power, and that the poor, the needy, the suffering, were experiencing the punishment of God for their sins, either for the sins of their father, or for the sins that they've committed in this life, or even for sins that they had committed in past lives. This was actually a major argument during that time, whether or not people were being punished for the sins of their parents, or whether they were being punished for sins that they had committed in a past life. But that's going down a whole other rabbit trail. The point is Jesus um, used his parables to turn this idea on its head and say, no, it's not the rich and powerful who are blessed by God. It's those who care for the least of these because I am in the least of these. All of that to say that that idea was emerging during that time, but still it would appear that the most commonly held view of the Messiah was of a mighty military leader who would conquer Rome and set the Jews free through violence and bloodshed would establish a world peace. And then the era of world peace and utopia, which the prophets had foretold, would come about. Here are some of the religious beliefs that were widely held in Jesus' day. Number one, that the Messiah would establish world peace through violence and bloodshed. Number two, that the materially blessed and powerful were blessed by God, while the poor and the oppressed were being punished by God for their sins. Number three, to please God, you had to meticulously follow out all the demands of the Torah, which was the religious law set forth in the Old Testament, and the Mishnah, which was the oral tradition that had been added to the Torah and passed down through the generations. So this is the context of the culture into which Jesus was speaking. Jesus' message can best be summed up with these words, repent because the kingdom of heaven is near or the kingdom of heaven is here or at hand. The word used for repent in the New Testament does not mean regret, guilt, or shame. It actually means change of mind. And this makes a lot of sense when we look at Jesus' ministry because Jesus did the exact opposite of shaming and guilting people for their sins. It was the religious leaders who believed that sinners were guilty and in need of punishment, that they were in fact already being punished by God. So the Greek word for repent means to change your mind, so you are changing something in your inner state of awareness. This change in state of awareness, whatever it is, is directly connected to the gospel of the kingdom. What is this kingdom of heaven? And I believe that we find the best representation of what the kingdom of heaven is in the gospel of Matthew chapters five through seven. The reason why I say this is because in Ch Matthew chapter four, Jesus begins his ministry. Matthew chapter four seventeen. From then on, after John was arrested, and Jesus was beginning his ministry on his own, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. And Matthew chapter four ends with Jesus traveling around, healing all the sick who were brought to him and preaching this gospel of the kingdom. And in Matthew chapter five, we go straight into what exactly Jesus was teaching. And this teaching spans three chapters and we get a lot of detail. Matthew chapter five begins with the Beatitudes in which Jesus does what he is constantly doing, turning the, the religious beliefs of his day on their head. He says, for instance, that it is the poor in spirit, or in other words, not the materialistic who will enter the kingdom of heaven. This is speaking directly to the religious belief that those who are powerful and wealthy were blessed by God. He also says that it is the meek, not the powerful and violent, who will inherit the earth. He is speaking directly to their belief that the Messiah would establish peace in the earth through violence. He says that those who show mercy, not those who judge in self-righteousness as the religious leaders of the day did, 
will receive mercy. And right in the middle of this list, we see something very interesting, which I believe gets right to the heart of the gospel message. Jesus says that those who are pure in heart will see God. The religion of the day was all about following the rules and laws and customs and traditions. And Jesus is saying, it's what's in your heart that determines whether or not you know God. The rest of chapter five is Jesus expounding on what it means to have a pure heart. Matthew 5, 17. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. Anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So keep this in mind because in just a few moments he's going to tell us exactly what he meant when he said that he came to fulfill the law. He goes on to reinterpret various passages from the Old Testament law. Verse 21, you have heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. Verse 27, you have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Verse 38, you have heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. So all of this to say that it is what's in the heart that matters and that our actions mean nothing if they do not flow out of a pure heart. Chapter 5 culminates with this in verse 43. You have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemies, but I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In this way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven, for he gives us sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends his reign on the just and the unjust alike. But you are to be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. And this is the heart of Jesus' message. Be perfect on the inside like God. And the way to do that is to attain a state of completeness and perfection in love. James chapter 1 verses 3 and 4. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow, so let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete needing nothing. But when Jesus talks about offering the other cheek, he's not condoning abuse. I think this is pretty clear from his entire life in ministry. That's a subject for another day. But what he's talking about is becoming so perfect and complete in the oneness of the love of God in your heart that you are impervious to offense, that you receive and give forgiveness so freely that you cannot be offended because um, your inner state is not dependent or affected in any way on anything outside of you because you are perfectly satisfied and secure within. You have fountains of living water bubbling up from within and like the sun that shines on the evil and the good, you give and you love and you shine your light indiscriminately on all around you, completely irregardless of how they treat you. Because that's the nature of love. That's the nature of God. God is love and love is unconditional. Love is security, stability, satisfaction, purity, perfection completeness. So what is the purpose of the law that Jesus came to fulfill? It is to be perfect like God, which means inner oneness with God, which means inner security and satisfaction in the love of God, which leads to radical inner purity and indiscriminate compassion. It means a change in your inner state. Remember, repent means to change your mind, shift your awareness, to rise above what the apostles called the flesh, what Jesus would have called the deeds that flowed out of an evil heart, rising above materialism, greed, self-righteousness, and judgment, becoming impervious to the desires of the flesh, anger, lust, greed, fear, because you are so firmly rooted and satisfied in a state of completion and perfection in love within. God in you 
That is the fulfillment of the law. All right, moving on to chapter six. The first half of chapter six, Jesus is still addressing the importance of the inner state of the heart because chapters were added later. So um, really there was no break here. Jesus warns against doing religious acts to get praise for them, such as praying, fasting, and giving to the poor. This is living in the flesh, um, the desire for attention, pride, thinking that we are separate and better than others, judgment. Jesus also says that we will be judged in the way that we judge others and that we must forgive to be forgiven. This is because what we give, we receive. Giving and receiving are the same thing. Um, that's why the Bible says it is more blessed to give than to receive because anything that you give to another person, you are doing to yourself. We are one with God and with each other. This is the greatest commandment. Lord our God is one, love the Lord your God, and love your neighbor. So when you give judgment to someone else, you are ultimately judging yourself. And when you forgive someone else, you are ultimately forgiving yourself. The second half of the chapter is about seeking the kingdom above material things. And since Jesus' emphasis so far has been on the inner state as opposed to to the outer world, we can assume that the material things is again referencing the outer world and the kingdom is referencing something within. We are told not to worry about what we will eat or drink and live in a state of trust that God will provide. This again goes back to that state of perfection and completeness. We are one with God within and anything that God has, we have access to. This allows us to rise above the needs of the flesh, a state of separation and need and lack, and into perfect oneness with God. Again, this is about transcending materialism and earthly concerns and storing up treasure in heaven. And if it is true so far what we've learned, that the kingdom of heaven is about um, a state of inner purity and completeness and love, then we can assume that storing up treasure in heaven would be about inner treasure. So it would be about developing that connection that we have to God so that we can think and see and experience only good. Um, the fruits of the Spirit begin with love because God is love and that's the first thing that must be acknowledged and recognized in the heart is God who is love and out of love flows joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. These would be the treasures of the kingdom of heaven that we are told to store up. Moving on to chapter 7, in verse 12, we see something very interesting. Do unto others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. So Jesus said in chapter 5 that he had come to fulfill the law, and now he's telling us exactly what that means. It could not be more simple. Treat others the way that you would like to be treated, because how you treat the people around you, you are treating Jesus and you are treating yourself. At the end of Matthew chapter 7, we come to four teachings which are commonly taken out of context. First, we have the teaching on the narrow gate. Verse 3, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to destruction is broad and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. What's interesting here that the word translated destruction is actually translated hell in the version of the Bible that I'm using. Um, I looked it up and it actually means destruction, so I said destruction when I was quoting it, but this is a prime example of what I mean when I say these passages, sorry, my cat, the, you cannot do that right now. My cat is trying to shake my stool here, um, but this is a prime example of what I mean when I say that this teaching is taken out of context. The church takes this teaching to mean that those who do not follow the creeds and doctrines of the religious system of Christianity will end up in hell, while those who do will end up in heaven. Within context of the entire teaching in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, Jesus appears to me to be saying that self-righteous judgment, materialism, greed, love of pleasure and power and the praise of people, living out of the flesh and lack of an awareness of oneness with God and neighbor, lack of love, this is the way to destruction. The narrow gate, in contrast, is the way of inner peace, 
purity, and perfection in the love of God within. This is the way to the kingdom of heaven. It is repenting, changing your mind, shifting your inner awareness, experiencing God within, growing into an awareness and a completeness in the experience of God within your heart that allows you to transcend the flesh or put to death the deeds of the flesh as the apostles described. Next, we have the teaching on the tree and its fruit. Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. Just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, you can identify a people by their actions. So Christians take this teaching out of context and use it to attack other Christians who don't hold the same intellectual beliefs and doctrines that they do. But uh, intellectual beliefs and doctrines is nowhere in this entire teaching of Jesus. In fact, what Jesus says is that false teachers are dangerous because they have bad hearts. And you can tell somebody with a bad heart because they have bad actions. They do not treat people with love. The religious leaders of the day were harsh and unreasonable and oppressive towards people. They took advantage of people, making money off the people who came to the temple to worship God, putting unrealistic burdens on people's shoulders, thinking that people were being punished by God for their sin and that they were better than these sinners. That's who Jesus is talking to. These are the false teachers that he is calling out. Next, we have the teaching on the true disciples. Verse 21, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. And what are God's laws? God's laws, as summed up by Jesus, is do unto others as you would have them do to you. Ironically, Christians take this passage and flip it around to mean the exact opposite of what it means. And they say that only those who have accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. Those who do not have a men correct mental understanding of Jesus will go to hell. But here Jesus says the exact opposite of that. He says that not all those who call him Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of the Father in heaven, which in context, the law of God is to love your neighbor as yourself out of a pure heart of indiscriminate compassion. Last, we have the teaching on the wise and foolish men. Verse 24, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who built a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey, it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Christians, once again, like to use this passage to teach that anyone who doesn't accept Jesus as Lord and Savior will go to hell when they die. But that interpretation is nowhere in this entire teaching. What Jesus actually says is that those who build their life on these teachings, that means these specific teachings he is giving them in this sermon in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, will be like a person who builds their house on a rock. And what are these teachings? Those who are not materialistic will have treasure in the kingdom of heaven, which is within their hearts. The meek, not the powerful and violent, will inherit the earth. Those who judge harshly will be judged harshly. Those who forgive will be forgiven. Those who are pure in heart will see God, not those who are concerned with religious doctrine and creed and tradition. The sum of the law is to treat others how you would like to be treated, to have an inner state of perfection in indiscriminate love within, to be impervious to offense because your inner state is so secure. It is anchored in an infilling of God's perfect love within. I believe this is what he means when he says that the person who follows his teachings will be like a person who builds their house on the rock. They cannot be moved or shaken or offended. Um, they are not 
uh, blown around or affected by what is happening around them because they are secure and satisfied within. And on the other hand, the person who does not follow his teachings is not secure, will be tossed around by um, everything that's going on in their outer world, overcome by materialism and lust and greed and pride and judgment and the fears and offenses of life. That's why the entire message of the New Testament is about transcending the flesh and walking in the spirit. The spirit is defined as God in you. So what Jesus is saying when he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is here, um, which he describes as the gospel of the kingdom. This is where we got the word gospel from. But what Jesus is saying is that the time that the first century Jews had longed for is here, it had come. The messianic age or the utopian era that they had dreamed of is already within their grasp. The key to it is within us. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is within you. In Luke 17, 21, Jesus says of the kingdom of heaven that you can't say, look, here it is, or look, it's over there. It's not a place that you can go to because the kingdom of heaven is within you. Romans 14, 17 says that the kingdom of heaven is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Where, where do peace and joy and righteousness happen and where is the Holy Spirit? It's in your heart. Jesus is saying, repent, change your mind, have a shift of awareness because the kingdom of heaven is already within you. If you don't shift your awareness, if you don't change your mind, you will never see it and then it will never be made manifest in the world around you because the way to the kingdom of heaven is not through materialism and greed and violence and war and bloodshed and judgment and force. The way to the kingdom of heaven is love, not marked by material prosperity and the praise of man and the pleasures of the flesh and of this life. The way to the kingdom of heaven, the way to establish peace and paradise on this earth is through love. It is through realizing that we are one with God and with each other and that we must treat other people in the way that we want to be treated. The world will be changed when each of us individually starts treating each person around us as if they were Jesus, as if they were us. The way to peace is not through violence, power, and greed. The way to peace is through hearts filled with the spirit of love which is the spirit of God. When the spirit of love or the spirit of God is acknowledged within the heart, it satisfies eternally as fountains of living water so that you become perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, and you can show indiscriminate love and compassion rooted and grounded in what you have within. Jesus came to establish and awaken the kingdom of heaven within each one of us. And I do believe that his death on the cross was central to that in more ways than one. I get a lot of questions on this because it hasn't been um, the focus of my videos, my past several videos. Yes, I believe that his death on the cross was essential to that. We will get into this. But my point right now is to show that Jesus' teaching on the gospel of the kingdom of heaven is very different from how we understand it today. Evangelical Christianity as a whole has made the gospel about politics, religious doctrine, tradition, and even in some circles, materialism. I've lost track of the amount of times that I've sat in church and heard Jesus use to justify war, materialism, judgment, and self-righteousness. It's astounding to me how blind we can be. And, and again, this message is not directed at people. Okay, people are people are so precious and, and are meant to be loved. My passion here is directed against the religious system. Um, Christianity as a religious system needs a reform. We need to wake up and understand the message of Jesus was about the heart, not about doctrine, not about politics, not about tradition, not about judgment. It's about a state of love, oneness with God experienced and expressed. The full coming of the kingdom is up to us. Jesus' second coming is about his spirit. 
or his consciousness dwelling in every heart fully as prophesied by all of the Old Testament prophets. God's plan is for every person in the world to come to know him. That has always been his plan. Jesus' first coming, in which he entered into our sin and death to defeat its power over us, initiated this process. He came to shift our inner state of awareness. I believe the second coming of Christ will be his spirit dwelling in every heart fully. Habakkuk 2.14, for as the waters cover the sea, so the earth will be filled with an awareness of the glory of God. Now here we are, 2,000 years after Jesus' first coming, and we are still on this journey. The growth and progress of humanity has always been slow and messy and God has always met us where we are. But we bring a lot of unnecessary suffering on ourselves and we will continue to do that if we don't make changes within the church and in the world at large. Jesus' message was the kingdom of heaven is within you, transcend the flesh and be one with God in your heart. All the suffering that we experience in this world we have brought on our by following our own way and living out of the desires of our flesh. Christianity has gotten so off track throughout history and is still off track today, but I'm encouraged to see a move towards love. We really need doctrinal reform and there's still a lot of resistance to that. So I'm asking each one of you to help me spread this message, this beautiful, simple message of Jesus. God is one. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. Be one with God and be one with your neighbor by loving them from a pure heart. If you have questions on any of this, feel free to leave them in the comments. I love hearing from you guys. Be loved, be happy, be at peace, and thank you for watching.